Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to another ChrisMartinson.com podcast. I am your host, of course, Chris Martinson. What do we want the world to look like in 40 years? Yeah, it's a really important question. In any credible business, one develops a strategic business plan. And no matter which of the many excellent strategic methodologies one employs, the basic output is the same, and it consists of the answers to just two questions. Where are we going? How are we going to get there? Of course, the challenge goes beyond deciding where you'd like to be and then simply arraying your always too limited resources intelligently against that task uh, because there's uncertainty, there's competitors, uh, potential disruptors, both positive and negative along the way. Nothing is ever really linear and neat. The future instead is typically shaped by chaotic systems and exponential growth. So any good strategy must take note of these realities, put a stake in the ground, and yet remain flexible. What then is our national or even global strategic plan? Do we even have one? You know, where are we headed? Do we have a far-reaching, crisp, and flexible strategic plan that all the key stakeholders understand and intelligently align their activities around? Well, if such a plan exists, it's well hidden from my view. A simple reading of the daily newspaper reinforces the idea that if our current trajectory had to be defined by a single word, I would choose the word unsustainable. Now, 40 years ago, a group of researchers at MIT ran a study to address the question of how humans would adapt to the physical limitations of a finite planet. That study became the book Limits to Growth, and it could have and arguably should have been a starting point for a discussion, but sadly instead became a lightning rod for controversy with many, some dismissing the study without even having uh, read it, as far as I could tell, and let alone having a serious adult-sized conversation about it. So here to discuss that study is Jorgen Randers, one of the authors of Limits to Growth, as well as his new book, 2052, A Global Forecast for the Next 40 Years. Welcome, Jorgen. Thank you. So could you tell our, our listeners a little bit about your background, what you currently do, and, and, uh, and uh, what you're up to in life right now? Hey, I am a 67-year-old professor. Uh, and obviously from Norway, as you can hear from my wonderful mm -hmm. accent. I've spent uh, one-third of my life in business, one-third of my life in academe, and one-third of my life in uh, non-governmental organizations. So I have a fairly broad perspective on life. Uh, I've spent the last year uh, trying to write a clear description of what I actually think will happen over the next 40 years. And I've done this because I have spent the last 40 years trying to make the world a more sustainable place. And uh, I must admit that I don't think I've had very much positive impact. And so no, since I've only 20 to 25 years left to live, I thought it would be interesting to find out what actually will happen. You know, what kind of decisions uh, humanity actually will be doing over the next 40 years. Excellent. So let's start with limits to growth, because there's some, some history there, some experience with, with what worked, what didn't. First, what was the, the purpose in the study of that book? What, what aims were you seeking to achieve in its publication? This was way back in 1970, 72, was the two-year period of work. Uh, largely, uh, what we tried to do was twofold. First of all, to try to tell the world that the planet is actually very small, much, much smaller than you think, uh, in resource and, and the pollution uh, terms, that is. Uh, and secondly, and much less uh, observed, was the fact that we tried to answer the question, you know, what will happen when rapid population and economic growth hits the limits of the planet? You know, what happens when you crash with the boundaries of, of planet Earth? And uh, basically, the way we told the story was to, to say that, uh, you know, there are various possible scenarios. We described, you know, different ways in which the world future could evolve from 1970 to the year 2100. We had a fairly long time horizon. Uh, and the aggregate conclusion from all of those studies was that most likely what would happen was that the world would continue to grow uh, throughout the 20th century and for a generation into the 21st century. 
and in the process would you know, reach levels that could not be sustained in the sense that they would require more resources and generate more pollution than the world could handle. And then we would get the crash basically uh, back down into sustainable levels, you know, in the middle of, of this century. The book was, however, a, not only a warning that this was the likely development on a 100-year horizon, it was largely written by young, enthusiastic and optimistic people like hmm. myself who all believed that that once people listened to this message, they would quickly do those very few things that are necessary in order to create a, a sustainable world. And that's, of course, where I've been disappointed over the last 40 years. Yeah, it turns out that sometimes information alone is, is not sufficient to, to really uh, create the change we're seeking. So, uh, But before we, we talk about that, let's get a definition under our belts, sustainable yep. and its derivative, sustainability. Can you define those for us? Yeah, I can. And, and it's actually very simple, although most people think it is very complicated. Sustainable simply means that it can be continued for a very long time without change. So, so if you rely for your well-being on the use of a non-renewable resource, you know, that clearly is, and, and that non-renewable resource, be it oil or coal or gas or, or titanium, if that resource is limited and you're using a little part of it every year, you know, clearly this thing is not technically sustainable in the in the very, very long run. However, if at the same time you spend money on R&D to develop a substitute for this uh, non-renewable resource, which you can then shift into once you have used up the non-renewable resource, then I would say that your behavior is sustainable. So it's simply uh, the answer to the question, you know, how long can I do what I do now without changing style or behavior? Uh, and if the answer is more than a couple of hundred years, I would say that the thing is sustainable. If it is less than 20, I would define it as clearly unsustainable. Right. So, I, I, you know, when I read Limits to Growth, I, I saw it as, first of all, it's a modeling study. So there's lots of inputs and, and there's, of course, uncertainties around these inputs. But, but the thrust of the argument to me seemed to be to say, listen, if we try and maintain status quo indefinitely, that's impossible because yeah. status quo requires us to indefinitely use up what are clearly non-renewable natural resources. So that will have to shift. And you're saying there will be some adaption to this scarcity that might arise because we will find substitutes and, and uh, find other ways around some of these. And some of these will require us to um, adopt new stances, of course, because once you run out of something that doesn't have a clear substitute, uh, then you just you, there's not much you can do about that. You, you just have to simply um, adopt a different stance. So uh, solar thin film uh, that requires uh, something like indium or gallium, which we just don't have enough of, and someday we run out of that, well, if that's it, we probably won't be relying on those uh, particular types of, of solar panels, but we'll shift to something else would, would sort of be the message. As, as you looked into, again, with limits to growth, I'm very interested. Like, like To me, that seems so sensible. What was the controversy about then? Well, I think that uh, you're absolutely right that this, there was controversy in spite of, as I said, you know, the message being very optimistic and very positive. You know, it basically said that, you know, as long as we watch out for the physical limitations on, on the planet, the planet is more than big enough, you know, and, and our ability to find substitutes, substitutes or a redirect uh, our societal behavior is big enough that that we can create a sustainable uh, world for very many people. But uh, the reception was not along those lines. First, you know, since people apparently dislike intensely to change behavior, mm. you know, they, they are, of course, quickly looking for ways out. Uh, and the, the simplest way out was to attack the assumption that the world is small. You know, in 1972, you know, uh, most people seem to live uh, with the belief that the world is actually very big, that there are places where you can find those resources that are uh, currently limited in one place and that you can easily dump a lot of pollution somewhere without bothering, you know, too many people. 
And so I think most of the discussion in the 70s was on the question of whether or not the world is small. And uh, the antagonists argue that it is much bigger than we assumed in our model systems. And in many ways, they won the argument because 20 years down the line in you know, when the Rio, the first Rio meeting occurred in 1992, uh, limits to growth was in many ways discredited, you know, in the sense that it was viewed as a weird report uh, by the global realm, not to the global realm, but uh, by the global realm, which actually had the wrong message. Ah, so uh, this is an, an interesting sort of a point here, is, which is around how uh, what we might consider a challenging message, how that gets out and gets adopted and, and understood by people. And one of the things that I run up against a lot is is sort of uh, one of the primary logical fallacies. Um, sometimes when I'm uh, discussing my work, people will say, oh, you know, there was this guy, Thomas Malthus, who said something like that once and he was wrong. Therefore, you're wrong. Which is, which is one of the largest logical fallacies there is. So, so 40 years ago, you're definitely groundbreaking, and I'm really thankful that the conversation, even if it didn't go swimmingly, got started on some level. Uh, you know, first unpleasant messages are ignored, then they're attacked, and then you win. So maybe we're somewhere along that spectrum. 40 years has passed, and here we are today, and I would argue that the world is in a, um, a different position to begin to uh, accept the idea that there are limits to some things, maybe to groundwater that's certainly known in some parts of the world, maybe to the amount of soil that you have, maybe to uh, the amount of oil that's certainly becoming clear. At least cheap oil is is in the rearview mirror at this point. There are other forms, but it's vastly more expensive than what we used to get, et cetera, and so forth. So um, let's just before we we dive into your your new book, tell me about if you've what you've seen shift. Here we are, forty years later. What kind of a reception are you experiencing now? That's a good question and an important question because I think that the major thing that has occurred over the last 40 years is that most people know know that we are in unsustainable territory in the sense that the current way of life on planet Earth requires more planets than the one we have got. You know, we are requiring more resources than the planet can supply every year, and we're dumping more pollution every year than the the planet can absorb. And the simplest, so we are in overshoot, which is the technical uh, term when the footprint of humanity exceeds the the carrying capacity of the planet. Uh, The simplest example of this is, of course, climate change. And and the fact that uh, humanity is emitting, you know, roughly twice as much CO2 every year as is being absorbed by the world's oceans and its forests. And so for practical purposes, in the practical debate about limits and growth and and sustainability, I think for the time being, it's helpful to concentrate only on climate, on energy, on the use of fossil fuels and the resulting CO2 emissions, because that's such a clear uh, case of overshoot, and it has the other pedagogical advantage, namely that the technology necessary to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions while at the same time maintaining the quality of life that we have and the purchasing power that we have, all those technologies are available as we speak, and the cost of implementing them, if we decided to do so, are minuscule and a couple of percent of your income. Right, and and yet uh, in many cases that isn't being done. So, um, but That's this, I, you know, across the surface of the globe, of course, uh, adoption of anything is going to be uneven. Where have you been invited to speak lately? Who is who is actually at say a national level beginning the process of of looking at this idea of sustainability of limits of things like that? It's interesting that in spite of it being both technically feasible and relatively cheap to solve the climate problem, it is largely not being done. You know, we have now been speaking as uh, humanity for 20 years or so since the Rio meeting in 1992 uh, when we started the UN Conventions on Climate Change and decided to do something. Since then, we have basically been speaking, and, and uh, emissions are growing faster now than they have grown 
ever, you know, in the history of man. Then who are, so mostly nothing is being done except uh, talking. If you then start looking at who actually does something, it's it's interesting that, uh, first of all, the European Union, you know, the, is amazingly progressive uh, on this score. Uh, the commission in Brussels, which is uh, an ele- a non-elected uh, group of bureaucrats are, of course, actually quite progressive on this score and are trying to push the members of the European Union into sane policies with some degree of success. Another interesting player that is doing much more than people think are the progressive multinationals. You know, the really big multinational corporations uh, are often doing a number of useful things in this area, largely because they have a much longer time horizon than most people. They are concerned about their own reputation 20 years down the line and would like to avoid mistakes. And the third group, which is of interest, that actually also does much, much more than you should expect, is the Communist Party of China. The Chinese are at the same time organizing a tremendous economic growth and a tremendous increase in their resource use and in their pollution output. But at the same time, they are probably going to be the ones who will solve the climate crisis on behalf of the world because they are putting enormous amounts of money and efforts into to climate-friendly technologies and climate-friendly behavior. Well, I think in the, my reading of China is that they clearly do understand the resource limitations. They uh, Obviously, their mercantilist policy of open checkbook acquiring land in Madagascar, uh, copper mines in Afghanistan, uh, oil rights all over the world. They're, they're scouring the globe looking for resources. And it turns out that good economic policy in a resource-constrained world happens to be good climate policy. It happens to be good uh, environmental policy. It happens to be good reduce, reuse, recycle policy. Uh, they, they all actually converge. And, and so this is one of the mysteries to me is how the debate has been framed as you're either pro-environment or pro-business, when in fact, if you frame it correctly, they're on the same side of the playing field. I agree. And uh, I think the most interesting example here is the United States of America, where you know, the, the, the sane uh, energy policy would, of course, be to try to stop the, the, the reliance of the United States of America on imported oil from the Middle East. And this can, of course, be very easily done in the United States by building a number of windmills in the prairie and then instructing Detroit to make electric cars. And, uh, you know, as described by Al Gore in his book a couple of years ago, you know, uh, with a, within a 10-year period, you, you could do this with great support from the farm lobby, which would be happy to have the windmills on their windblown territory. And uh, Detroit is, of course, capable of producing electric cars if instructed to do so and, and uh, you know, instructed to sell them. And so... This policy, which would be sane energy policy, which would have short-term benefits in the United States because it would drop the reliance on, on the Arabs, you know, is also exactly what you would do if you wanted to introduce a climate policy in the United States, namely trying to phase out the use of coal, oil, and gas as fast as possible. And, of course, this is the way to phase out the use of oil, which is largely used to run automobiles. Ah, so it is, it's a complete mystery because there are many things that we could identify using existing technology, in many cases decades old technology, which would, whether your lens was, I care about national security or I care about the climate or I care about social justice, meaning people can't afford energy anymore as it rises in price against disposable income, or I care about jobs, uh, there's, I don't care which lens you look through. I can find all kinds of technologies out there that you'd say, well, listen, like heating hot water. You can do that very simply with a solar thermal panel, very easy technology. Uh, and, and we are currently burning hydrocarbons, lots of them, to heat water, which we don't have to – really, we could cut that either to zero in many parts of the country and, and by at least half in, in the remaining parts. And we don't do it, even though it makes – Economic sense, political sense from the job standpoint, you know, social sense. It makes all kinds of sense, but we don't do it. So uh, we need to – that to me says we have a problem with our narrative. It's not the information itself. It's the story. There's something there blocking us from doing that. And I want to turn now to your new book, 2052, A Global Forecast for the Next 40 Years. I, I presume one of the intents of this book is to sort of lean on the conversation, to open that narrative up. Tell us about your book. Uh, you, you spent a year writing it. 
What do you what are you seeking to achieve? And then we'll move into what's in there. At a personal level, what I'm trying to achieve is rather selfish. I would like to know what will actually happen over the next 20 to 25 years in the sense that I have been worrying about the future for 40 years uh, and it has really bothered me every day you know that uh, humanity uh, tends to make the wrong decisions you know every week you know uh, relative to my worldview. Uh, so, no, I thought that it would be interesting to try to find out how much damage wrong decisions in democracy, democratic society and in capitalist system is going to, to, to create uh, on a 40-year or on a 20 to 25-year horizon, which is uh, my remaining uh, lifetime. So that's the personal motivation. The, the, uh, the professional motivation is basically to try to kick the system in another way. Uh, you know, I've tried to work for sustainability in all possible ways this far, but I have not tried to scare people into mm-hmm. to doing something. So this is that kick, you know, trying to say that, you know, if we continue more or less as we have done in the past, you know, we will really get a climate crisis in the second half of this century. And I would go... Uh even further faster and and suggest that uh, preservation of the status quo will lead to an economic crisis uh, of an extraordinary dimension. We're already in the early throes of this because our economic model is based on infinite growth, exponential growth, not a lot, two, three, four percent a year, maybe five if we're having a good year. And that requires, uh, you know, what is an economy but the flow of goods and services. So those goods, what are those? Well, you chase them back. Those are resources. So what we're really saying is we need um, – you know, two, three, four percent more stuff coming out of the ground next year compared to last year, and uh, and and that's just. I think we're already pretty close to that limit in a number of places. So that's fine. You know, we have slightly less stuff coming out of the ground. It doesn't sound like a disaster, but in fact, when your economic model, your money system, requires that growth in order to behave, uh, it, it it can be a problem, a huge problem. And so the reason I care about that is that many of the things that you're talking about in your book in terms of things we could do or that Amory Lovins talks about from the Rocky Mountain Institute about things we could do require a complex and functioning economy to get them done because these are these are in many cases very sophisticated technologies and and to adopt and implement them on a grand scale will require extraordinary resources so I, I concur with the idea that it's time to kick the can, you know, kick the kick the patient, because <laughs> time's wasting uh, at this point compared to the size of the the predicament. So status quo, we don't change anything. We just trundle along until circumstances really force us to take a good hard look at this as a culture, as a society, as a globe. What what does that future look like? Well, I, the, this is the one interesting finding among a few you know i thought a year ago that uh, since i have spent 40 years thinking about these things that i had thought about most of the things that one could think about in this context but i think i have learned one new thing from from uh, doing this study and that is that what you just said needs to be rephrased uh, basically what will happen in the rich world or the OECD countries the, the one billion people that are in the industrial world what will happen uh, half of which are in North America and the other half uh, elsewhere uh, what will happen is largely that we will try to continue economic growth you know we will try to pursue the model over the last 40 years and we will discover after the fact that we do not achieve any growth. So to speak about it in simple terms, you know, the auto workers in Detroit, you know, have, of course, been uh, hoping to have a race, you know, sometime over the last 30 years. But uh, when you look back at the races they have actually gotten, it it has been eaten up by inflation. So in reality, the take-home after-tax pay of a guy in Detroit now, a blue-collar worker, is the same as it was 30 years ago, in spite of living in a society that is trying to grow, has been trying to grow all along, and to some extent even has succeeded in growth. What I think will happen over the next 40 years is that the guy won't get a race even during the next 40 years, and most of the Americans will be in that category. 
that you know America will try to increase its GDP, but it will not succeed. Basically, meaning that the upturns in the economy to one or two or three years will be eaten up basically by the ensuing downturn two or three years, and so that we will come out 50 years down the line more or less at the same uh, GDP numbers as as currently. And we will luckily have a slightly smaller footprint because there will be technological advance in the use of energy per unit of GDP, and there will be also improvements in in the climate game so that the footprint will be lower, the economy will be the same, uh, and people will feel much, much poorer than they feel today because they have, will have been through an endless you know, 40-year period of stagnation, basically. Well, I, I agree with the general sweep of that. The, the part that I'm, I personally am concerned about is the idea that uh, it's around money itself and, and that money is a marker for real things and that as long as there's a balance between your real stuff and the amount of money, things are, are okay. Um, what we're discovering now is that a lot of promises have been made in Europe, in the United States, Japan, their pension promises, entitlement. They're fairly long-range projections that say, you know, we're going to take some money in today and, and we're going to give that back to people over time and their purchasing power, important concept you're bringing up, will, will, will be delivered to them. We take it today, we deliver it back in the future. Those promises now are many, many times larger than the GDP of the world currently is. And, and so one thing is absolutely true in this model as it's constructed right now, that in order for the pension and entitlement promises, those cultural societal promises we made to ourselves to be true or to be kept, we need the economy to grow a lot, not in nominal terms, but in real terms. Nominal meaning not inflation adjusted, real being inflation adjusted. What you're describing is that we've actually already hit a period of stagnation for a set of reasons. Um, uh, it's a very complex system, so those reasons could be many fold, but at least part of that, in my mind, has got to be um, around what we're seeing with our net return from energy that we're getting back out of the ground. That's that's cornerstone of my, my set of our, um, uh, arguments and thinking. And and so as we cast forward, here's here's the general sweep. I can describe all non-renewable natural resources like this. They're all of much, much, much lesser quality than they used to be. So we're not chasing 10% copper grades anymore. We're chasing 0.2% copper grades. We are not chasing oil that's 1,000 feet down. We're chasing oil that has to be cooked off of sand because it's not actually oil. It's bitumen or something worse like kerogen. Um, we are no longer uh, finding, you know, vast surface deposits of things uh, like coal. We're, we're out of anthracite. We're, we're through the bituminous practically. We're, we're into the subbituminous. Now we're looking at lignite. So, so these stories are all a story of saying less and less concentrated resources, which require more and more energy in order to extract. So we have those sweeps coming along and we're on our way to 9 billion from 7 billion. All of these things come together. When you put all those in your model, what turns up in 40 years? So uh, what turns up uh, is the first thing, uh, namely that we will try to grow, but we will not succeed. So that's uh, the first one. And there are many reasons for that, which we can return to if necessary. The, the second thing which turns up is that I don't think resources is going to be the problem. The, if we were to put the finger on one problem, it is lack of coherent long-term decision-making. Mm. So yeah. in order to, to make my view in contrast to yours, or to try to make the contrast between the, the two a little clearer, I think that the reason why the United States is not going to be on a per capita basis richer in 2050 than it is today has nothing to do with the resource uh, uh, unavailability. I think that there are enough resources available to, to handle the U.S. need to 2050, particularly since the U.S. need is not going to increase very much over the next 40 years. Uh, the second, uh, but the reason why I think there will be problems in the United States is that uh, uh, the U.S. is incapable of making the societal decisions that are necessary in order to move coherently in uh, a progressive direction. You know, and, and the current stalemate in, in, in your parliament, you know, between the two sides that basically keep each other from, from making clear decisions on anything is the real head of the monster, the way I see it. 
And that's the reason why I think that China is actually going to do very much better. They are in the same resource-constrained world as is the United States. But they have, and they are even, and they're much less well endowed domestically with resources than the United States is. Still, I think they are going to do much better because uh, those gentlemen are at least capable of making a decision. You know, they analyze the problem, they see what is the problem, and if they have a problem, they solve it. You used the example that when they observe the fact that they cannot grow enough food, they buy land or at least lease land in Africa and elsewhere in order to provide the food. I can tell you that that is true, but it's also very much against what the Chinese want to do in the long run. The, China has been self-sufficient for 2,000 years. They are not interested in being elsewhere. They would like to make a good life for the Chinese on Chinese territory, and that's their long-term aim. And so it, the way I see it, their purchasing or leasing of land in Africa is a temporary stopgap and a very rational measure over the 20-year period before they get their own agricultural system going, plus their own population declining. You know, the, they have pursued the one-child policy now for 20 to 30 years, or actually since Deng, so it's only 25 years. And the Chinese population will peak, you know, within the next 10 years and then start to go down, you know, which makes it much more easy to make China sustainable. All right. So uh, I agree with that with that view that China definitely has um, a view of the future. They, they have a I, I can detect a, a credible strategic plan, whether they'll succeed in it or not open to question. But at least I, I see that they are facing what I consider to be the realities of the world. In your book, you add up many of these realities and say, listen, if we don't change, this is there's some disruptions, potentially some very challenging times. You know, sort of almost the best case is we wake up in 50 years and discover we're all just a little bit poorer. But there are some other outcomes that exist in there as well. And I note that you start the preface of your book with a, a quote from Vaclav Havel of the Czech Republic, um, which basically says, uh, he says that hope is as important as life itself. So you're 67. Let's subtract uh, 47 years from that. What, what would you say to a 20-year-old today who looks through this lens, through what you're seeing in your book, through whatever, even if they're just reading the newspapers, and they're looking at a world that's just fully indebted and uh, crumbling or lackluster infrastructure, and, and they see all of these challenges, that narrative that we're asking our 20-year-olds to step into, how do you, what, what do you see for them, and what advice would you give them? Three pieces. Uh, first of all, uh, be in favor of a strong government. You know, basically teach or learn that individual action or a, comp or a market system is not going to solve the problem. It will require collective action, you know, in the form of governments providing regulations or legislation that actually makes it profitable for the com corporate world to do the right thing. Currently, you know, the whole world is doing what is profitable. The world is not doing what is needed. And... The reason is that the ordinary voter carries the floor, and most of those are not in favor of strong government, and consequently we have a problem. So my first advice to a 20-year-old person is to learn and understand the, the rationality and the smartness of stronger government in the, in the next 40 years. The second thing the person should be doing is to be aware of the fact that the main challenge is the climate challenge. And that basically means that he or she should stop using coal, oil, and gas. These are the main sources of climate gases. And it's very, very simple to each time you are faced, <laughs> you want to do something, you know, just stop, just be sure that it doesn't require coal, oil, and gas to do it. So it basically means that when you want to buy a home, be sure it is well insulated so that it doesn't need a lot of electricity to run the air conditioning. And when you want to buy a car, buy a car that uses little fossil fuel per kilometer. And when you want to fly somewhere, you know, instead of flying twice on vacation a year, fly once and stay twice as long. You know, then at least you uh, reduce your three major parts of, of uh, CO2 emissions. Third one, when one is making a forecast over the next 40 years and looking into the question of whether the young are actually going to repay the debt uh, and the pensions of their fathers and mothers, mm -hmm. my forecast is that they will not. You know, many of us 
you know, expects that we will be paid handsome pensions and and uh, and many of the wealthy that have lent money to people expect to get the money back. I think that that's a pretty moot wish in many cases. It is even unreasonable in many cases that 20 or 25 year old people who cannot afford to buy a new home, which is the same standard as their parents, that they in addition to this should then pay pensions and pay back the debt that was accumulated by uh, their parents to live way beyond their means uh, for a period. And so basically what you see in, in South Europe now, I think, is the first step in that process where, you know, a number of pension pensioners will see that they don't receive all the pension that they expected to do to to receive and many bankers or capital owners will see that they have lent money but they will actually not get it back and that's uh, one way in which you know the the system will solve problems in a rather surprising manner over the next 40 years uh, so here, here's a, um, let me play devil's advocate for a second. One of the things that's really important, I think, is for individuals to have a sense of agency, that, that, their, that their actions have consequence. What would you say to somebody who says, well, if I cut my carbon use, um, won't that just mean that China burns it instead? Is there anything you can see credibly on the horizon that says humans will not extract every hydrocarbon out of the ground and just burn it, whether it's us or an Indian or a Chinese person now or in, in 50 years? of course what i have spent one year trying to answer you know so my book is a quantitative description of exactly what i think uh, the societies of the various regions of the world are actually going to decide to to decide to do over the next 40 years you know so that's a lot essentially that's a question of how many children will they have how fast will they be able to increase productivity in their societies? In other words, how much GDP will they be able to, to generate? Then comes the question of how fast will they manage to increase the energy efficiency of their economies? And then finally, how quickly will they be able to move their energy systems away from fossil fuels and into to, uh, renewables? And I agree with you that on my radar, there is no collective global agreement to do these things over the next 40 years, we simply will not be able to reach agreement on that. On the, but at the same time, luckily, there are much saner society on the surface of the earth than the United States, which are actually starting to do things, even if the others are not doing a lot. And uh, my book is a quantitative precision uh, forecast of who will do what and how much. And the sum of all of it, as I said before, is that, you know, things will progress. But still in 2050, uh, I think that roughly 60% of all energy will be fossil-based. We, only 40% will be from wind power and solar and nuclear and, and uh, you know, the non-CO2 sources. The temperature at the time will be plus 2 degrees centigrade over pre-industrial time, and 30 years later, in 2080, we will be at plus 3 degrees centigrade when there is a danger that the permafrost melts and we do get self-reinforcing climate change. So it's basically a story where humanity acts much too slowly uh, and then basically forces their grandchildren to live in a world where there is self-reinforcing climate change. Right. And, and so somebody who's, who's young stepping into this would like to feel that they've got um, some, some impact that they could really have on this. Uh, you know, when I, when I look at these, these large long-term forecasts, I, I, I see the grand sweep is, is kind of easy to, easier to detect, which is that there's shifting geopolitical power and balances. A lot of it centers around resources. Interestingly, a lot of the so-called undeveloped world or developing world I consider to be in much stronger shape because they have less debt. They haven't had the capital system there to really uh, exploit the resources at, at a breakneck speed. So Brazil, you know. Uh, used to be considered uh, a developing world, but it's very, very much uh, up the curve, and they've got tremendous resources and whatnot. Um, so, as we look into this into this future, it what you're saying is we need to start really making some changes uh, very, very soon, very rapidly. These changes are going to happen to us. 
Um, and, and I guess so we either face a future shaped by design or, or by disaster. And, and the idea here is, is to at least get the conversation going and saying, look, here are the risk factors. And, and, uh, we might not know everything about all of these yet, but, uh, these are the risks as we see them and understand them today. How should we be arraying ourselves against these? And the puzzling part to me is that there's so much that we can do that doesn't require anything new to be discovered, understood, or, uh, introduced it. It works. All you have to do is decide to do it. And, uh, that's where this conversation gets interesting. And for, for me, you know, to, when I talk to young people, I, I say that's, that's your opportunity right there. That's where the hope is, is that we need, uh, to figure out how to just start making, to put a term around it. We're going to, we either make the right decisions or the wrong decisions. And the right decisions are, they're just sitting there. They're, they're economically, right they're politically right they're they're right on all dimensions except i don't i don't know what they just they run counter to our current narrative whatever that happens to be so in some ways this is as simple as changing the story we tell ourselves i think you are much of what you're saying is correct i think that if i were to put the dot at the end you know i would basically say that the one major problem is the short-term nature of of humans which is in turn reflected by the short-term uh, horizon of the capitalist society and of the democratic uh, system of governance both of those systems you know or all three actually the individual the firm and uh, a parliament are strongly focused on the effect of what they're doing over the next two to four years they are not strongly influenced by what happens 20 to 40 years down the line and that is the basic problem unless and unless we solve that problem in some way or the other in, uh, we will not handle the the oncoming uh, barrage of, of problems uh, that will face us over the next uh, century and and my view is of course that we ought to try as hard as possible to overcome the short-term nature of man, the corporation, and, and uh, the democratic uh, parliament. Uh, but I don't think we will do so. We ought to, but I don't think we will do so. And uh, it's, you know, it's a final word on, on, on the 2052 book. You know, I dislike intensely to describe the future that I do describe there, because it is, of course, not the future I would like to see. I would like to see a, a totally different uh, society where man, corporations, and the parliament actually make decisions where they do cons put at least 50% of the weight on the long-term consequence of what they're deciding, and thereby manage to, to get... Uh, uh, and more decent society, you know, for their grandchildren. And there's the challenge. And you've laid out uh, the alternative to that more hopeful future uh, in terms of your experience and watching trends and and, uh, and making your best guess as to where things end up. And, and there's quite a few surprises in this book. It's it's not all uh, there. Are, you, you talk about how technology will, will both um, mitigate and uh, create uh, additional difficulties all on its own. And, and, and there's there's quite a lot in here. And um, it's very good. I'm I'm looking at an uncorrected proof here, so it's not yet in print here on May 24th. Uh, when does it come out? It uh, you can go in Amazon.com and order it now, uh, and they will start shipping on the first of June. Ah, very soon. So, well, very good. Uh, this is Chris Martinson, of course, and uh, we've been speaking with Jorgen Randers. Jorgen spelled with a J. Uh, J-O-R-G-E-N, Randers. And uh, thank you very much, Jorgen, for your time today. Thank you. It was a, a great pleasure. And uh, I hope many people read the book and get irritated and help change the way the world is governed. Well said. Thank you. This concludes this podcast by Chris Martinson. To gain further insight into where things stand today and what might happen tomorrow, please visit chrismartinson.com. That's C-H-R-I-S-M-A-R. T-E-N-S-O-N.com. Please join Chris Martinson next time to continue your journey toward awareness, understanding, and action.